G'day Harbour Church Growth Groups, this is Tom Batty here and today we are looking at Hebrews chapter 1. So, let's break it up. Uh, first one, long ago, at many times and in many ways. So we can see we've got <clears throat> three ideas going on here. So we'll just kind of put them underneath each other. We don't yet know what it's talking about, <clears throat> but we just want to see that uh, we've got three ideas coming together. So long ago, uh, many times and in many ways what happened <clears throat> it's that God spoke uh, and that's the main action of this sentence that's where the verb is and the subject actually so we'll put that as a bold uh, and then who did he speak to we well, spoke to our fathers and how did he do it he did it by the prophets but the thing about this sentence I'll just kind of <clears throat> keep it up there on its own for the moment uh, is that the most important part about it is that God spoke. So we're going to keep that next to the margin, and the rest of it we're going to move across two tabs like that, and you'll see why in a second we're going across twice. So long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke. Uh, and so we'll leave that over here. And how did it happen? Uh, or who did it happen to? It happened to the fathers and it happened by the prophets, and so we can see immediately that the author of Hebrews uh, is telling us that he is also a Jew, because he's connecting our um, with, you know, he's he's the one who shares the fathers as well. So we know something about him. Apart from that, we don't really know who wrote this. It's anyone's guess. Uh, okay, that's the first sentence. Now, the second sentence over here, we'll move this back up. Uh, it's introduced with the word, but... But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. This word but isn't actually there in the Greek, in the original text. Um, but it's helpful to see that there's a contrast going on. And we'll see a little bit more of what's going on here. So the first part, uh, but in these last days. Okay, well, that's an idea. And then we'll get the next bit. He has spoken to us by his son. So he has spoken is the main bit. Uh, so I'll make that bold so that you can see the prominence there. Uh, who did he speak to, to us, and how did he do it, uh, by his son, uh, and then we'll move this bit down here for the moment so that we can see this is just the section that we're dealing, dealing with right now in verse 2. Uh, and you can see, again, the main idea, the main verb, that the action that's going on here is that God is speaking, and in order to show that that's the most prominent, uh, I'm just going to move this over here and this one over here, and this one over here, and that way we can see, I might even put a little gap in between these two so that we can see uh, the symmetry that's going on. So, uh, just like in verse 1, there's a few things at the start. Uh, long ago, many times in many ways, God used to speak, uh, God has done that, uh, but in verse 2, there's a contrast, in these last days. Now, this little term here, last days, the Greek word for that is eschaton, or, and this is where we get the, uh, the word eschatology from, the, the study of the last days. And this is important, this is the, the days that we are in right now, the days after Jesus has turned up and before Jesus will come back to judge the world. Okay, so that's kind of theologically significant, uh, but I hope you can see also that there's a bit of symmetry going on here, and I'll try and highlight this as well. So God spoke. Who did he speak to? Uh, let's make that one green. And in this one, who did he speak to over here? Let's make that one green so you can see the matching that's going on. Uh, how did he do it in the past? Well, he did it by the prophets. Let's make that one yellow. Uh, and how has he done it now? By his son. The last thing that I want to point out uh, is the difference here between this little section and this little section. In, in the Greek here, there's only one verb in this entire two verses, or two sections here, and that one verb is just here. It's that he has spoken. And even though this word technically in the English, or this one just there, spoke, is a verb of its own right, in the Greek it's not. It's like a a sub-verb. It's, it's not even, you know, a full kind of thing. Uh, so it, in that sense, we know that this section is inferior or subordinate to this section over here. This is the main part of the sentence. Um, and this is 
Uh, this is why the this English translation, translation, the ESV, has tried to represent that by saying he has spoken compared to this one where it's just God spoke. And so that's just trying to give the prominence uh, to this, this section over here. Okay, now that we've got that, we can move on to the rest of verse 2. Uh, and it begins with this word just over here, which is whom. Now, whom, whom is the whom talking about? The whom is talking about the son over here. And so when we've got a relative word like that, then it's good to line them up underneath so we know exactly who we're talking about. So we've got the son here and then whom over here. Uh, and now we're going to learn a, a few things about this son. So the first thing uh, is that he was appointed the heir of all things. That's the first idea. Okay. Now we'll move on to the one, second one. Second idea, we'll try and line them up exactly. Yeah, that's good enough. Uh, through whom he also created the world. That's the second idea. So the first one is, is kind of pre-creation. Uh, and now the second one is creation. Uh, see how we're moving through the, the history of time here. Uh, and now the third idea, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. We'll, we'll leave that. Oh, maybe I'll line the three up. I don't know whether to line the three up or the word up. Anyway. We'll leave it at that. Um, I think I want to line the word up. That's a bit better. Uh, the third idea is that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Now, even though this sounds like it's two word, uh, two ideas going on in that it's got radiance uh, of the glory of God and the other one which is the exact imprint of his nature... Uh, even though it looks like it's two ideas, it's actually one concept represented with two different ideas or two, two different images. The first one is it's the radiance of God's glory and the second one is the exact imprint of his nature. Both take us back to uh, Genesis where it talks about uh, mankind being made in the image of God, but the difference here is that Jesus is not just in the image, but he's the exact imprint and he's the, the full radiance of the glory of God. So that's our third idea in this list of things that are all about the sun. Uh, and the fourth idea, uh, oh yeah, we've already got it here. Uh, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And that's interesting that it says word of his power and not power of his word. I'll leave you and your growth groups to try and figure out what that means. Uh, but the next idea, if we move it under here, I might uh, try and line these up. Looks like I need to line that one up as well. Uh, the next idea is it says, After making purification for sins, Jesus, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the main idea of this sentence is actually this one here, the, the he sat down at the majesty on high. We could actually make complete sense of the sentence uh, if this section didn't exist after making purification for sins. This is entirely decoration, and I'll try and I'll get rid of it for the moment. And you can see, uh, if we follow it along here, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power, and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You can see how it completely makes sense without that, but this bit, just here, is entirely decoration. And so when there is decoration, it's really significant. Uh, and we'll see why that's significant later on, but in order to show that it's not the main idea and it's not needed, I'm going to put it, I'm going to indent it just a little bit and so that it's directly above sat down. That makes sense? Uh, and that way we can kind of show that that bit, although, uh, although helpful, is not needed, but uh, this section here, after making purification for sins, is basically like all of chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Hebrews. And so we'll see that later on. Anyway... Let's keep going. So we've got how many ideas about the sun? One, two, three, uh, four. And this is the fifth one. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay. And we'll stop there and move on to the next idea. And this last one is a little bit confusing because it, like after making purification for sins, is also a little bit of decoration. But it's a clunky sentence, so in order to make sense of it, uh, what I'll do is I'll move it over as well, because this one belongs underneath sat down, okay? How uh, Jesus was able to sit down only because, get this, 
he had become much more superior to the angels. Why is that? Because the name that he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And so uh, what I'll do is I'll pop that just underneath here. And that kind of should line it up to make a little bit more sense of it. Okay, so that is the whole of Hebrews chapter 1, 1 to 4, broken up into a flow chart. And so I hope you can see that in all of these verses there is actually one idea. And it's really uh, just here, this little bit. It's all about God has spoken by his son. The final word to us, this final revelation, is all about his son. So that's the big picture. Uh, now, your job in growth groups is to talk about significance. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, and what did it mean for the original recipients of this? And what does it mean for us today? All right, have fun.